This week I have another new complication to learn about. This is a very important video because it highlights many of the issues that I think our sector faces when new procedures come out. The temple lifting technique um, is a very clever idea that suggests that if you add filler into the temple, you may have a, an effect on the lower face. I first saw this published um, in a paper and I was never a fan of the entry point. So if you watch my previous video on scalp necrosis, there have been a number of really severe vascular occlusions caused by occluding the vessel that runs right anterior to your ear, which is where the entry point is, the superficial temple artery that supplies the scalp. Now, if you occlude that vessel, you cause a large necrotic injury that causes scarring to the scalp and also a loss of hair, which is permanent because you cannot do a hair transplant usually on scarred scalp. So a devastating complication that is very important to know about. But this is not the same complication. Dr. Maria Landau, who I think is really good at identifying these complications when they come out. She's also done a previous piece of research and case studies on indentations in the forehead after botulinum toxin, thought to be caused by oils within the devices that we use. But in this paper, she reports on the side effect of alopecia without necrotic injury. So the idea here is there's something about the pressure of these injections in the scalp that is causing hair follicles to die, even if the scalp itself does not necrose. I recommend that you have a look at this paper titled Non-Scarring Alopecia After Temple Lifting Technique with Dermal Fillers. So what could be going on in this case? I think that pressure itself is enough to disrupt blood flow. We already know that one of the causes of male pattern baldness is a decrease in blood flow to the follicles. So a little bit of pressure and in fact a tightening of the scalp has also been suggested as a potential theory about why people lose their hair. So it's not really a surprise that increasing pressure underneath the dermis under the scalp could also cause hair loss. But naturally when new techniques are developed, the complications are not often a large part of that initial flurry of activity and excitement that we all get when something's new. And this is probably one of the best pieces of advice I can give you as an aesthetic practitioner, is whenever something new comes out, you probably don't wanna be the first one on the list to try it. It's good to let it bed in, learn about it by all means, but wait until there's some data before you do it on your favorite patients because I've never been a fan of leading the way with new procedures. I like to see them function well, give them lots of thought, think about the potential things that could go wrong and then use them later on after the initial excitement has died down if I think it's the right thing to do. In these case reports, we hear the story of a patient who does detect discomfort and pain and clinicians who responded appropriately, reversed the procedure and then restore blood flow only to find the hair falling out in subsequent days. On a positive note, over the next few weeks and months, as long as necrosis was prevented, then the hair growth eventually restarted. But like we've already discussed, if you cause scarring on the scalp, it is likely that the hair will never regrow. I think it's important not to underplay this as a side effect. This is a devastating side effect for someone to suffer, which is a permanent patch of hair loss that will never recover. Last year, when I first talked about this subject, I had a number of clinicians from around the world report that they'd seen devastating injuries from this particular procedure. I'm not saying there are thousands of these, there were three cases that came to my attention, but all three of them seemed really quite severe for what we tend to talk about mostly in medical aesthetics. So this is large necrotic wounds, attempted surgery and flaps to try and fix things. And unfortunately, I couldn't get the clinicians to come on the record and talk to me about it, or even to report it in the normal way to create a case report. And this really makes me sad because the reasons behind that is simply fear. There's a fear that if you are the one who reports a colleague who has done a procedure and, and had a negative side effect, that you will face some sort of consequences. And of course, this is a real thing. None of us want to be seen as the bad guy. And I really hope over time, we can change our perception of this and realize that complications must be reported in order for all of us to learn and get better. And the, actually often the only way to know these things will happen is to try and to see the failure. That is actually how medicine often works. I'm sure we can do better and I'm sure we can do things in a more controlled way, but it's really important that if you have a side effect or a complication and you can share the information whatever way possible without 
purposely hurting someone's reputation, but just to get the information out there. This is a really good thing for patients and a really good thing for the whole industry. I was frustrated at not being able to get the information out because it matters so much more when you have a real case report. But now, thanks to the work of Dr. Landau, we can actually see this in a publication. So I really appreciate Dr. Landau for allowing us to talk about this topic and to share her paper. And I recommend you have a read of it and learn more about it and make sure your patients are informed. So let me just explain this technique and why I think it's inherently risky in case you haven't thought about it already. The entry point is described as being one centimeter preauricular. So this area here is exactly where your superficial temple artery runs. And you can actually feel it pulsating. I can feel mine right now, roughly in exactly the same point that I might enter a cannula. So I'm not sure why this injection point was chosen. And of course, you could make the argument that you could be at the right depth and therefore be safe. And presumably that depth is relatively deep. The problem with this is as you're sliding this large cannula up, the cannula naturally wants to be more superficial. And I always think about these procedures being done thousands and thousands of times and think about what the likely accidents would be. And it's quite clear to me that an, a cannula that wants to be more superficial when you're trying to be deep, combined with an area of skin that's covered with hair so you can't actually see how deep the cannula is very well. You also then can't see the discoloration of the skin if you have a vascular occlusion or a decrease in blood flow combined with a very large volume of filler that's required. We're doing a full mill in many cases, just in one spot. This is a recipe for risk. It's something I think is, is obvious when you come at it from the point of view of reducing risk first, rather than creating a new procedure or getting the result. And it's something that um, I encourage you to see all potential new procedures in this particular way, which is give me the five ways it can go wrong before you think about all the things it can go right. Because that's actually, the most important way to make decisions clinically about what you decide to do or not. Some of you may be wondering whether we should stop doing this temporal filler lifting technique completely. I think like with all things, it's a balance of risks and it's for you to decide whether you think the results that you get from this procedure justify the risks. I personally would not like to do this procedure because I know I can get great results by not doing it. And the amount of filler that you need and the result that you're gonna get, I can quite easily get really good results that I think are at least as good by injecting cheeks and temples and the preauricular area and all the other things you can do with dermal fillers and other non-surgical techniques that make this not the best use of money with the uncertainty that goes with it. So I personally am not particularly interested in learning how to do it or doing it, but I'm, I'm also not gonna be judgmental over those who believe that it's worth the risk because I don't have the experience to say how amazing it is. If you're getting amazing facelifting results, and it's the best use of your product and you've got safety systems that counter some of the risks I've talked about, potentially it's okay. So, um, but that's for you to decide. So if I was forced to do this procedure, and this is a, a good mental exercise to think through the risks and how you can adjust for them, um, is to ask yourself, if I was forced to do it, what would I do to decrease the risk? Um, the first thing is I wouldn't enter in that exact point. I don't like being parallel with arteries with large cannulas, so I would at least move my entry point more anteriorly so that I'm at least crossing the artery. I would also use an ultrasound to try and find the artery before I start an injecting. I would probably use a lower viscosity product. I wouldn't use a particularly, I don't want to create a bump on someone's head, which I've heard some clinicians do as part of this lift, I would like the tension to be evenly spread across the scalp. So I'd actually rather put maybe more in, but over more of a space if I had to inject, rather than creating this bolus over one particular site. I would also um, be educating the patients to get in touch if they have pain, and I would consider reversing earlier because I can't see so easily what's going on. Obviously lots of consent in terms of what the potential risks are. So I hope you have found that helpful as an exercise in terms of understanding risk, particularly of new procedures and how unexpected side effects often emerge years after people start with the, the new thing. If you'd like to read Dr. Landau's study, we will drop a link in the description below. If you'd like to see the other really interesting video about a new botulinum toxin side effect that Dr. Landau discovered, which involves getting a dent in your forehead after a treatment, make sure you watch that video at the end.